for Sunday, the 3rd of April. I'm Randy Coure coming at you live via Apple's ColorCast app and Facebook Live. Thank you so much for joining us. If you are downloading today's episode via your favorite podcatcher, thank you so much for the download. On today's episode, we will be talking very heavily about the uh, World Cup draw that took place on Friday. Of course, Canada will be participating in the World Cup in Qatar in 2022 in November. Uh, the prodigal son is returning to Scotiabank Arena. Kyle Lowry will play his former, former club, the Toronto Raptors, for the first time since signing with the Miami Heat. Uh, in rapid fire, Formula One is returning to Sin City. Uh, two clubs have, uh, well, uh, first, uh, there has uh, some uh, controversial comments with regards to a color commentator, with regards to an NHL hockey game. Should you be punched in the mouth for skilling it up? That and a lot more for the second time in What's Up podcast uh, history, for lack of a better term. We have three panelists joining me for the roundtable. We, of course, have the veteran, if you will. Tony Antonio is here. Tony, how are you? Hey, how's it going, guys? Doing great. Uh, we have the uh, rookie, if you will. Uh, Frank DeFrenza is back once again. Frank, what's going on? What's going on, guys? Nice to be here again. And uh, like Cal Lowry making a return to Scotiabank Arena, <laughs> Dan Liggeri is back uh, representing the radio broadcasting program 2004 from Seneca College. Dan, oh, we missed you, man. Hello, hello. Missed you too, Randy. It's good to be back. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, guys, uh, first things first, though, and I'd be remiss if uh, we didn't have a chat about this. And so very shocking and very sad news out of Ottawa as Sen's owner Eugene Melnick has passed away at the age of 62. He had a liver transplant in 2015. Uh, to this point, there hasn't been uh, an official uh, cause of his passing. Um, Dano, I'd love to uh, start with you. And uh, I mean, any hockey fan can acknowledge uh, Melnick's passion for the team. He appeared to be brash. He seemed to have severed a lot of ties uh, from front office staff to uh, star uh, players from the Senators, Daniel Alfredson being one of them. How would you summarize Melnick's tenure as owner of the Sens? Melnick's tenure is probably, uh, you know, impossible to summarize in a, in, a, in a short thought process. You know, he's not as um, disliked or even hated by the fan base as, say, uh, Harold Ballard might be in Toronto, but he's definitely a polarizing figure in Ottawa. And like you said, you know, to sever or to uh, burn bridges or to, to not, you know, make franchise players like Daniel Alfredson feel welcome at every turn or maybe even invite them to work for the front office or, uh, you know, make every effort that you can to get on his good side is not going to bode well for Eugene Melnick's legacy. But it's a complicated one. You know, over the past couple of days, uh, a lot of sports commentators and people in the press or even fans have made mention that if it wasn't for Eugene Melnick, would the Senators still be in Ottawa? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But, you know, he definitely helped solidify, um, you know, keeping that team in Ottawa. And you can't argue that they've had some pretty decent success um, in the last little while anyway. I know that they're sort of uh, bottom feeders now and they're rebuilding towards um, what they hope will be a, you know, a long stretch of success. And they've got some good players in the pipeline. So, you know, it, it's sort of, a, sort of a mixed bag. If I was an Ottawa Senators fan living in, in Ottawa, I don't know that he would be my favorite person per se, but I don't know that I would, uh, you know, welcome a new ownership group as much as I might, uh, you know, if, if I was someone else. But so I, I'm sure it's a love-hate relationship for, for many people in Ottawa. Uh, you know, Gary Bettman loved him as an owner because if he was nothing else, he was, uh, he was loyal and he was uh, he had deep pockets and he cared about the game or at least seem that way so you know he will be missed from that sense but I think down the line he'll just be remembered as the person who talked a lot I don't know <laughs> well yeah you know like, like the people will side with Daniel Alfredson in the long run just because he's their captain he's the, you know he's, he's sort of their heart and soul for a long long time 
it's just like when uh, you know when in Toronto there was a big thing with and I'm, uh, I'm pausing a little bit because I'm drawing a blank on his name. Dave uh, Keon. Like, I, Dave Keon, exactly. That's exactly yeah. what I was thinking. So in the long run, players, you know, the you know, history will side with the player. They always will. So, you know, I guess it is what it is in Ottawa. But, you know, he will be missed to some degree for sure. Well, you know, uh, it, it is uh, uh, interesting. And uh, we do have to remember that there was a lot of uh, hands changing ownership with the Ottawa Senators. The original owner... Uh, you think of Bruce Firestone, Rod Bryden, and I remember him having press conferences all the time saying he can't afford the team. And then uh, Melnick comes in. I mean, you know, Frank, I I did ask myself if Melnick was in a different position as other owners of Canadian NHL teams. I mean, uh, the arena was not in a convenient part of the city. Uh, you know, I, for one, went to a, a Senators game in Ottawa on a Saturday afternoon against Winnipeg. It did not sell out. Mm. Um, and then there was comments that he made after uh, before the 2017 Heritage Classic. He said comments like, I'm not going to blow a lifetime of working hard to support a hockey team. It's not going to happen. Uh, he went on to say the bigger question is whether I'm prepared to blow all that money I made over the years in a different industry, in a different country, how long can you underwrite a team? Uh, that started a social media campaign from pe- uh, fans, Melnick out, hashtag yeah, Melnick yeah. out. Uh, fans, want, uh, Sens fans wanted him out, but I do agree with the guy, Frank. Exactly, man. You're you're in it to make money too, right? Like, first of all, rest in peace to him and condolences to the family and all and everything. But in the end, yeah, you're in it to make money and for, the stadium being that far away does not help the case at all, man. Like you got to bring it downtown in the core and where everyone can get to it. Access makes it easier for the fans to get to. Like on a weekday, who has an hour, an hour and a half to travel to get to the stadium and an hour, an hour and a half back afterwards. Like, yes, you're a true fan base, but still like you have a life to, to get to and take care of. That's why downtown Toronto is easy. Everyone has access to it, subway stations, everything. So the infrastructure there doesn't help, but I've always found the, outspoken they were outspoken too much that the senators group owners all the time and talking and you don't hear that much from other organizations and the owners always chiming in all the time and stirring up the fires and especially to say something like that before a heritage classic celebrating the 100th anniversary i don't know just poor taste right like you've got to pick your spots i mean maybe you think of uh like brash ownership uh not really uh having a, a lot of controversy i mean i can only think of one off the top of my head and that's mark cuban uh, yeah. I don't know about you guys, but uh, yeah, uh, there definitely seem to be a lot of people uh, packing their bags uh, because of uh, Melnick's positions on things. But, uh, you know, Tony, uh, 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 apparently the team is uh, now left uh, with two uh, with Melnick's uh, two young daughters. Uh, they're young adults, like 21 and 19. Uh, uh, you know, who, who knows uh, what their intentions are with the team? But I mean, you know, you take a look at a league perspective and look, cynics, it's easy to say that uh, the NHL and Gary Bettman, all they care about is money. He's licking his chops to get one team out of Canada, maybe move it, move it to a place like Houston. Uh, do you think the league sees an importance to having a franchise in the nation's capital? I think so. Yeah. And Gary Bettman, he doesn't want to actively move teams that he's helped establish in markets because it makes him look like a failure. So that's, that's never something Gary, Gary Bettman's interested in. Um, You know, some of this stuff that Melnick would say in the past, it's posturing, right? This is a political game too. He, He was playing this game with the city, trying to get an arena to move downtown. Um, This was a cash. This was not exactly a cash cow for him, the Ottawa senators. So, you know, there was a passion for him. What a lot of people don't realize, too, is is the imprint he's had on junior hockey in the GTA when he was owning the St. Mike's Majors. I mean, he uh, he affected junior hockey in this area as well. Now, it didn't take off like it does in other smaller towns in Ontario, but I, I think they'll come to a re- resolution. There'll be a new ownership group in Ottawa. It's going to stay in Ottawa. And um, I hate to say this because the man has passed away, but it might pave the way uh, for a downtown arena a lot easier because the relationship he had developed with politicians down there was rocky to say the least. 
So this might pave the way for the downtown arena that the senators are looking for <laughs> if with, him out of, is, with him out of the picture. <laughs> if Phoenix is staying in Phoenix, Ottawa's not leaving, man. I don't see that happening. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Phoenix is playing in a 5,000-seat arena for the next few years, <laughs> well, which is know, about uh, right for them. I know, I know, I know. It was 25 years uh, ago, but if I'm not mistaken, it was Batman who was uh, in control when the Nordique moved to Colorado, and when Winnipeg moved to Phoenix. If I'm not, yeah, I, I'm certain that uh, Batman was still, uh, yes, uh, commissioner of the league. I am wondering, like, and, and I'm not playing devil's advocate for the sake of it being fun. Like, I am wondering if there is more of a desire to have franchises in the United States. I mean, yeah, sure, they could get more money from expansion fees and so on. But uh, I, I, I don't know. Like, is there is it easier to get the approval or is there more of a desire? And obviously, we're speculating, but... That's what we do on this podcast. <laughs> doubtful. Uh, very doubtful. It, it would have to be, I think it's an absolute last resort. Like I said, Gary Bettman is not a fan of moving franchises. I don't think many commissioners are. I mean, you're talking about franchises that he didn't help bring into the league that he like, you know, he had no tie to the Quebec Nordiques because he wasn't responsible for expanding them into the league. He wasn't around them. Right. So him moving them, the team to Colorado in the nineties was not that big of a deal for it. But now these are his franchises, right? Mm. Um, well, actually, hang on a second. I think John Ziegler was commissioner when Ottawa and Tampa got their franchises. So yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Fact Ziegler check was me. fact check, fact check, yeah. but I don't think he's, I don't, it can't, he knows how touchy Canada is with their franchises. I don't think he wants to mess around with that. No, and, to, and to, to everybody's point of uh, maybe looking at a downtown arena, if you've been to Canada recently, you'll see that downtown is coming to Canada. Like they're building a whole community, a whole, uh, you know, city uh, 1A outside of Ottawa. And Ottawa is, a, is sort of a tricky downtown to be part of as well, where, you know, majority of it is uh, is empty most of the time because a lot of government workers live down there. And, there's, you know, there's not much of a nightlife, at least not compared to some of Canada's other bigger cities. So I can see them building a, a long-term home in Canada and just and moving the people out there rather than trying to move the arena into the city proper. So, um, you know, I sort of alluded to before, I think that, you know, for all of Melnick's flaws, and Tony mentioned it too, like he, he's, there are some bright spots in his, in his legacy and, and in his, uh, his ability to, you know, help build the Ottawa Senators to what they are today. And they're never going to be, you know, a big time market franchise just because they're not in a big time market city. But they have the support of being so close to Montreal and so close to Toronto or close enough that, you know, people won't mind making a weekend trip up there. So I think uh, I think the Senators are in a, in a good position as long as they don't go all uh, little big league or rookie of the year on them and have these, uh, these two uh, <laughs> run the team, which may be entertaining in and of itself, but, you know, could be could be a disaster. So we'll see what happens uh, as this moves forward. Yeah, no, uh, Dano does have a point uh, that, uh, and it sounds like that, Dano, you've uh, been to Canadian Tire Center. What the hell is it called now? Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Frank, Tony, I don't know if you guys have, but. Uh, yeah, I was there. Yeah, so. Yeah. Traffic is terrible there. So no matter Traffic's how you slice bad. it. Traffic's pretty bad. No matter how bad. you slice it. I, I think th there isn't a, downtown is where you want an arena to be. In my yeah, no, and uh, yeah. and to that, you have to think that, that that there's a lot of value to having a downtown arena. I mean, could they build a uh, like an entertainment district beyond the market in Ottawa? And uh, not 100 percent sure where Le Breton Flats is to the uh, the downtown core, but it does seem like that there is uh, a lot of desire to have uh, that uh, arena uh, built uh, closer to closer to uh, Parliament Hill. So. Uh, guys, uh, we'll step away for hockey for a moment and uh, talk about uh, the beautiful game. Uh, for the first time since 1986, Canada will be participating in the Men's World Cup. Uh, I can uh, recall being uh, at my first men's national qualifier. It was for South Africa 2010. It was ironically against Jamaica. And it was an experience that I just was so enamored with. This is uh, an event 
uh, that the entire world participates in, uh, you know, uh, with Frank and Dan being of Italian descent, uh, uh, Tony being of Cypriot descent from Cyprus, uh, me being from Sri Lanka. Uh, I took a look at the uh, FIFA world rankings, and I believe Sri Lanka is the, in the bottom five of the world okay. in uh, men's <laughs> soccer. So I take that with a lot of pride. Uh, but never did I think that Canada could qualify for the World Cup, like, you know, seeing countries like St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis, and yeah, we were beating them for nothing. Uh, but then uh, reality suck in, uh, uh, sank in. And uh, here we are. And uh, Tony, I know you've been to a, a number of qualifiers. You and I went to a qualifier together. Uh, what did that qualification mean for you? Oh, everything. Like, it, it, it's a sports dream come true for me. You know, you watch your team win Stanley Cups, World Series, NBA Championship, but it was always, I was always cheering for some other country. Like, I, I'm a huge fan of the Dutch national team. Uh, so that, that's the team I follow, but it doesn't feel the same because it's not your country. So, you know, it was a massive moment and I wanted to be there. And this is, it's exactly how I pictured it. You know, a cold day, a snowy day. It's kind of like how you remember when they clinched against Honduras and St. John's back in 1986, you know, it was dreary, it was raining. Um, it was just a perfect day. I, the moment for me, honestly, where when they substituted Atiba Hutchison on, you know, you knew the game was over. I, honestly, I was so confident once they scored the first goal, I thought, okay, there's no way Jamaica's scoring two goals. We got this. Um, but when he came on, it was like, what is this salty discharge in my eyes? Like I, I got, <laughs> I got emotional because it made me think of Dero and Julian de Guzman and Craig Forrest, Thomas Radinsky, Lyndon Hooper, Rowan Ricketts, you know, Simeon Jackson, McKenna, Peshka Salido and Corazine and Stalteri and all the guys who put that Jersey on in the past. And then I've gone to watch, like I've been the games at varsity stadium. You remember the Sir Stanley Matthews Cup that they played back in, you know, I think it was late 80s, if I'm not mistaken. It was a three-team tournament against uh, Greece and Chile, I believe, which they ended up winning. These are moments that, you know, I've been a part of. I was at BMO Field a few years back when when four Cuban guys defected right before yeah, the game. Yeah, I was there too. I was there too. Were you at that game? Yeah. Yeah, I so, was. Uh, and, and they scored that trick play off of the uh, – free kick they surprised everyone and just sent it across the box and I think Dero set the record at the time with that goal if I'm not mistaken I could be wrong I remember I, I remember a play like that but I thought it was Dero to Hutchison no, uh, but I think that was a Panama game so I uh, I'm, I'm probably thinking of a different goal okay regardless that's yeah. that's what it means to me it was those those moments I've had enduring you know getting getting through the Honduras loss eight to one um, you thought that's it. You're, you're never going to support this team again. And, uh, but I don't stop. I never stopped just following these guys, following their careers in Europe to see how it's going. E you know, it's, it was just such an emotional feeling for me. I'm not going to lie. It was, I, I was just standing there quietly with, you know, tears coming down because this is what, this is what I dreamed of, right? Like you, you want to see your country in the world cup and we're getting to see it now. Well, and uh, I, for one, don't remember uh, Mexico 1986, and I surely don't remember the uh, qualification, especially the uh, qualification clinching match in St. John's, but uh, it didn't really have the, uh, uh, well, soccer up until maybe USA 94 didn't really have the scope in this part of the world until that point in time. I mean, uh, that being said, and uh, going back to the uh, men's team, Frank, uh, how the hell did this happen? Uh, you know, I mean, it wasn't that long ago where uh, Canada was uh, struggling to, uh, like, they didn't uh, qualify for Russia, obviously. Uh, they went to the semis of the uh, recent Gold Cup. Uh, you know, there's, uh, the growth of soccer is obviously so evident. But in your opinion, like, uh, was it because uh, MLS came to uh, Canada in 2007, uh, starting with TFC? You, you got to think that the women's uh, team has uh, uh, 
inspired a lot of people, especially with uh, Christine Sinclair being one of the best in the world. Is it John Herdman, the coach? Uh, what What do you class? Uh, what do you think uh, this is the result of? That's uh, pretty much everything you've been saying. It attests to all that. Like uh, John Herdman is a huge, huge, huge factor for this team. And like from what he's built in the previous teams, he's always been winning. So like he's got that pedigree. Um, the, the players we got now, they're playing more all around the world. It's not just in Canada or North America. So we got that exposure on the big stages. You know, Alfonso Davies, one of the top players in the world. Hopefully he comes back to better health and, you know, can, can, can have his stamp on this team. I just think it's a bunch of everything, but growing up and we can all attest to this growing up, soccer has always been prevalent, right? Like we've always grown up in soccer, playing soccer and these young kids, it's no different for them. They grew up in the system. They grew up playing the training got better, more exposure. Like you said, MLS, I, the Toronto being an MLS has helped them a lot and bringing more awareness to Canada and the players that are available here and the talent we got, like we got our parents, everyone's from around the world, man. We got the talent here, but it's all come together now. And I think, I think we have a legitimate team, <laughs> like straight up, man. I don't know. Anything could happen. It's 90 minutes a game, man. Anything could happen. Well, I mean, you know, Frank, it's uh, so ironic that you say that, uh, you know, we all grew up playing soccer. Uh, full disclosure, I didn't. Okay, I didn't. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I do uh, remember uh, there was a, a recognition of Alex Bunbury, uh, you know, when he was uh, qualifying and trying to qualify for Italia 90. Uh, you know, uh, I th if I'm not mistaken, I think Canada was close to qualifying for USA 94. But uh, I mean... Uh, you know, 25 years ago, who the hell could remember uh, stuff like that? Oh, closer to 30. But even like uh, those guys, you know, like the Stall Terry and the Bents, like I, I, those guys went to my high school, man. So, well, Hutchison yeah. went to my high school. Yeah. yeah and uh, I actually had a. Uh, Dejan Buchanan, my little cousin, played with him when they were seven, eight years old. Like, it, well, it's, and, it's unreal to see all these players now. And it's like where we've come from. It, it's, it's phenomenal, man. I think, I think uh, there's more academies now. There's more room for development. There are a lot more facilities available. And when you mentioned John Herdman and his staff, they've managed to unearth these guys who've been transplanted for a few years. You know, there was, you, there was never an expectation that they would play for Canada because they kind of moved to those countries and stayed there and trained there. But they've met, like, Stefan Ustakio was a massive example of a guy they managed to get here to commit to play for Canada. Um, who was 100% devoted to just playing in Portugal, training there. He was born here, but, you know, his dream was, was, was to just train, develop. And, and so they've managed to get these guys and convince them to come, and it's helped so much. Vittoria as well. Um, Ukpo, uh, he had options. So they've, they've been tremendous salesmen as much as they've, they've had, you know, coached this team. And it's it's been a miraculous turnaround. So, uh, Dano, of course, the uh, the last time you joined us uh, for uh, a podcast was immediately after when Italy won the European Championships. Uh, if you could take a look uh, just uh, to uh, beyond my left shoulder, you could see uh, an Italia flag, uh, which I do uh, 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 wear uh, proudly. Uh, my uh, in-laws are Italian. Uh, of course, Italy did not make the uh, the World Cup, and uh, maybe we'll chat about that in a moment. But, uh, you know, uh, Italy, of course, qualifying for the World Cup, uh, you know, was pretty commonplace. I mean, all joking aside, I mean, like the last few World Cup, whatever. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, you've experienced uh, your side winning uh, the damn tournament. But now the country where you were born in is a part of the uh, – this uh, the biggest tournament in the world uh you know how much different does uh canada qualifying for the world cup compare to your experiences uh following uh the itzuri it's uh, it's it's strange to be honest uh, you know and, and we've had these debates you know if, if you come from a sports family which is or you know if you've got family members that follow sports which i'm sure we all do you might have had this debate at some point in your life where you know should canada and italy play each other in the world cup who do you root for? And the, and the answer always comes back Italy because it's Italy sport, right? You're sort of, you're, you're conditioned, you're, you're, you're brought up 
uh, you know, following and cheering for the Italian national team just because Canada didn't have a footprint in any of these sort of uh, these international tournaments. But then if you ask them if Italy and Canada play in hockey, who would you cheer for? That's right. And the answer 100 times is, is Canada, just because, again, Canada is the better team. They probably have a better chance of winning. They're more, uh, you know, they're more known for playing that sport. So, you know, to, to find myself in a position now where I'm of Italian lineage, but I was born in Canada. My son is born in Canada. He's more Canadian than he is Italian at this point. <clears throat> So, you know, to, to find ourselves in a position where uh, we were approaching a, the, you know, we're coming off of a European championship, for Christ's sake, and we can't even qualify. <laughs> Italy doesn't even fucking qualify for this tournament. I still can't figure that out. <laughs> right. So, so, you know, I used to always tease whether it was Portuguese or Brazilian people because they seemingly had this irrever or this reversible flag come World Cup time where if Brazil got out, they could just uh, unzip it and zip it back up this to is, Portugal. I didn't even think like, about that. Oh. Do it, Dano. <laughs> this is your chance. Let it all out. So, so, now, so, now, we are, so now we've become those people, right? I, I feel like I'm just jumping <laughs> Italian shit because they stink. You know, they can't even beat fucking North Macedonia. Let it but out, Canada baby. qualified, right? But, but to... To the points that that were made before, unless you've unless you've been a soccer diehard fan for years and years and years, and you know the names that uh, Tony rhymed off, and honestly, I don't, I'm not I'm familiar with some of those names, but I don't know them sure. intimately. You know, it, it's hard to just say that. Um, I don't know. I, I don't feel the same sort of passion for Canadian soccer than I do for Italian soccer, and maybe that's just because I spent so long, you know. In houses where people don't speak English, and you know, and, and come World Cup and Euro time, it was always such a big deal. Um, and having seen them won both those big tournaments at an age where I can actually appreciate it and, and feel that emotion and join the celebrations, you know, I can imagine. And and maybe and sorry, I'm just gonna <clears throat> go sideways for a little bit. Please, um, please. My, please. my mother-in-law buys my son a soccer jersey for his birthday every year. Not one that's going to fit him now, but one that she thinks he'll appreciate, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years from now as, as a collectible. And every year she asks me which, which jersey to get. And normally I go with the, with the person who wins the, uh, I don't have good, uh, good European language inflection, wins the Ball de, de or the, the ba Ballon, Ballon d'Or. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So normally so he's got a, he's got a Modric jersey. He's got a Ronaldo jersey. He's got a, you know, a Messi jersey. He's got an M Mbappe jersey. Um, but this year, you know, trying to see the landscape for what's to come, you know, we told her to get him a, a, an Alfonso Davies jersey because, you know, he's at that age now where he's, he just turned six. He's going to see Canada play in the World Cup for the first time. And for him, it's normal. And then he's going to, Canada's going to be in the next World Cup as well because we're co-hosts. So for him, Canada not being in the World Cup is more foreign than it is them being in the World Cup. So, you know, I'll be able to latch on to his, emotion connected to it because he doesn't know any different and again like i said he's more canadian than he is italian um but it's strange right now like i, I honestly don't know how to feel I'm, I'm, I'm super embarrassed and upset that italy failed the way that they did but i'm super proud and excited to see canada play in this tournament um right. so you know maybe my, my thoughts and emotions become more clear as we head into november but right now it just feels strange well, you know, and, and you bring up a good point, and uh, I'm kind of interested uh, if you guys could uh, sort of fast forward 30, 40 years from now, maybe the three of you will be grandparents, uh, and uh, as uh, you guys are, uh, as you guys are born and raised in Canada, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, our, uh, our parents' generation, uh, you know, that emphasis of our ethnicity, uh will not be as prevalent as it is now right and i'm never ever ever going to say that north american soccer is going to trump soccer from europe but as uh leagues develop more uh women's soccer leagues develop more in north america uh you know the canadian premier league is uh you know it's getting a little bit of traction i'm uh looking forward to the uh season opener uh, at york united uh when they play halifax i think um frank i mean is it possible, Dan, Tony, whoever, uh, chime in? Like, is it possible that maybe your kids might appreciate Canadian soccer a hell of a lot more than the four of us? Because, you know, it's so brand spanking new here. Well, it's what you're, it's, it, 
like Dan was saying before, it's what you're brought into, right? Like <laughs> you're brought into, I was always watching Italian soccer on Sunday mornings. You hear that song whenever a goal comes on, da, 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 like you knew it was on, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right then, like yeah, that's, that's what point. you heard every Sunday morning, every 10 minutes you heard that go off. So it's just what you're born and bred into. And I grew up watching Italy soccer. So that's all I knew. I didn't even know English soccer. I didn't know Spanish soccer. I didn't know it was just the Serie A, right? So but my kids now watching me and like watching me last against a game uh, against Jamaica, watching that so intently. And like, I'm like, after the game, even after the game, I'm like, stop, like quiet guys, just keep quiet and just watch this right now. When the drumming, <laughs> when you've seen, you know, they hold on to the crowd, like keep quiet crowd and just everyone getting ready to do that. And it's like, I'm like, just, this is the best part of the game. It's not even the game. I'm like, this is what I want to see. Right. And, and so hopefully that showing them that and them seeing that and how happy it made me make will make them happy and wanted to, for them to watch it. So that's Ryan. I, oh, sorry. Go on. Go on, go on. Uh, I, I don't know how much uh, my girls will get into sports and stuff, but I've taken them to a TFC game and, you know, admittedly, and it's partly my fault. They've, they haven't been steeped into the tradition that I grew up in, right? I grew up speaking Greek, never learned it, like Greek. They haven't been steeped into it. Yeah. You know, my, my mom tries, my mom speaks Greek to them, but I don't. So you're right. They're going to be ingrained in the Canadian. Like they watch me go to TFC games. I've taken to them. So they might grow up and if they're into sports, they'll be more TFC than they will say Manchester United or, you know, Juventus or right like it, it's yeah. based on what we watch and i think they will be more into canada and canadian soccer <clears throat> if they choose to follow sports i think it's 100 percent the case because i think as we get older you know when our kids has kids we're probably going to lose more and more of our culture if you're not on it if you're not teaching them and and like i said i'm partly to blame for that um because i didn't marry a greek woman so it you know, it's very difficult to do it, but I, I think there's something to that for sure. Mm. There might be an inherent challenge though, like it, it, and it, and it's something that sort of expands outside of sports in Canada, where if you ask somebody to define a Canadian, like what, what does it mean to be Canadian? There's not a good answer. We don't have a, uh, you know, the cultures that Italians or, or Greeks do or the traditions or the, even the culture or the, sorry, the, 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 the food or, or the music or you know what I mean there's uh, we have the tragically hip but you know there's uh, there, there's not this this you know this centuries old traditions of uh, let's say you know Frank like making tomatoes every August or, or September yeah. there's, there's nothing Canadian uh, like that hell, so, I, I, you know, I do that you do that too and it's great right but yeah. but there, 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 there's no one tradition that you know says you know my Canadian ancestors did this for hundreds of years so we're doing it now uh, and that's always a struggle to identify with uh, with Canada when it comes to sports, because they're you know because we're so diverse and we're so uh, eclectic and you know and that's part of the reason why soccer is is maybe taking off now because it's taking immigrants you know 40, 50 years to to show Canadians that you know this, soccer is the beautiful game and th and that's why it's it's the biggest game internationally, you know, hockey is 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 so so part of our lifeblood here that. It'll be hard to overtake. And I know what you mean, Tony, like where if your girls grow up watching TFC, they're more inclined to become fans of that team. But truthfully, if they're not good and if the Canadian national team is not good beyond this group of players, then that fan base will fall off just like it does with any other sport. So, you know, if they can sure. maintain and keep growing and, you know, win a game in the World Cup, you know, qualify consistently and, you know, continue to produce stars like Davies or David, um, you know, it'll go a long way to help define that Canadian identity and to help build that passion from within that, you know, if, if the four of us tried to describe it, we probably have a hard time because Frank, like you said it, Tony, you said it, it it's just, I was just born into it, you know, it, it, so it, it's just part of who I am, whether I like it or not, um, you know, and our kids will develop their own sense of identity just from being born into, you know, whatever situation they were born into. Yeah, and I mean, I guess um, the reality is, is that Canada just has such a new, uh, such a different identity than, you know, 60, 75 years ago, right? I mean, like our parents, my father came to this country in 1969, uh, my mother in 78, uh, whenever your parents uh, uh, came to this country, my father-in-law came here in 55. 
And uh, uh, you look at uh, those days to today. Yeah, what is a Canadian? I mean, take a look at the four of us, right? Like, uh, you know, we are as Canadian as Canadian is. And, you know, we are at that same first generation level. Uh, and uh, more and more uh, Canadians, and we're just so immersed, especially being a, uh, living in the greater Toronto area, that uh, we can go to Little Italy, we can go to Little India, we can go to uh, Greek Town, Danforth, and uh, the rest of the world is just at our fingertips in this in this town, in this community. And uh, but that's part of the problem too, Randy. Where because there's so much option, you know, I remember vividly listening to my father-in-law, God rest his soul. You know, when when the Toronto Star would come and or, or call his house just to do a, a generic survey of, you know, sir, we know that you're a subscriber. We want to know what you think about our service. And him going off on this poor kid for a half hour, how there's not enough soccer coverage in the, in the, in the sports section where it's all Leafs and it's all Blue Jays. Goes, I don't give a shit. I want to see Juventus and I want to see, you know, Real. So, you know, you know, fighting for to get soccer to even become part of the conversation, you know, took a long time, you know, to, to sort of uh, have those traditions or have that passion, you know, become part of their Canadian identity as well. You know, so it, it, it takes time and I'm happy to see that it's having a moment and I just, uh, you know, as a soccer fan, I hope it continues. It's funny you mentioned that because there's always been the argument from producers of radio stations or, or sports TV stations that, oh, there's not enough of an audience for it. So we can't have the discussion. There's not enough of an audience. So we can't put it in the front pages of our papers. And I always wondered if that was the truth, right? Because we're such a melting pot. And again, you talk about Canada and what do they see us at? I, I think the image of the polite, nice Canadian, I think it's real. I think it exists. I think they look at us like, you know, this melting pot of inclusion and freedom, despite what, you know, the narrative is that we're, a, you know, a, a garbage heap of a country these days. But I think that image, <laughs> I, I, I think that image is there and it's real. Um, but I also think what you've added as Canadians and we've had, you know, the attitude of the Canadian soccer team is kind of going to help that is that there's a bit of a swagger to us too. We're not, we're not sorry for being in the spot. It's not just about hockey. I hope the basketball program gets there, you know, eventually as well, but we're seeing it all around the world slowly, but surely so you got to create a mindset. I think that's what John Herdman's helped with too. Do not underestimate the amount of belief that they've, that he has instilled into this group. A lot of it is so much up here and, and they're starting to believe it when they're going to Honduras, when they're going to Panama, when they're going El Salvador, they're not defeated before they step on the field anymore. Um, but anyway, I, got off holding track them. Sorry, Tony. I, I think we have an audience for this stuff. If you just keep it on your programs, have a half hour session in the, midday show talking about soccer and i i think people will listen to it want to listen to it back to, what you're saying about, back to what you're saying about herdman what i love to say, i heard him say the other day is this is the team that has brought us to qatar but doesn't mean that's a team that's going to be in qatar oh so yeah like, for be sure your toes, be ready because things can happen things can change you know so and next player up and just that mentality is awesome it's, and it's a way of keeping the players not content and understand oh, yeah. We could we could see Petrasso and Roddy in Qatar. Mm. Make no mistake about it. If these guys continue to improve and get better, he's not going to shy away from bringing them on the team. You know, and his confidence. He's telling you we're going to score a goal in the World Cup too. That, yeah, that permeates throughout. And I hope soccer fans watch that. My first exposure to swagger as a Canadian was Donovan Bailey when he won the gold medal mm -hmm. in 96 in Atlanta. Yeah. It wasn't just about a Canadian winning the gold medal. That is the first time I think I saw a Canadian athlete with absolutely no fucking humbleness attached to him. Like I'm the fucking man. I won this. I deserve this shit. And I loved it. We needed that as a country. It's been a long time since we've had that. Well, yeah. And uh, I think, I think it came to stay after Vancouver 2010, because, uh, you know, we were yeah, top of the podium sure. for gold medals. Great point. Uh, there was a, an incredible um, as a video essay by Stephen Brunt, who is my favorite sportscaster. Uh, and, uh, you know, we just, I think, I think we just uh, came alive uh, after, uh, was it after Alex Bilodeau's first goal or uh, gold, or was it Sidney Crosby's golden goal? Uh, you know, who, uh, who really 
knows i guess we could uh think about that uh you know in the uh, days months years to come but, but yeah, it's just that whole that whole olympics in general you're right man big that's a huge point you just made man yeah 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 yeah, yeah. you know i uh, we could definitely go on and uh talk about this <laughs> and uh you know it's uh, such a great conversation i do uh feel that we should uh, maybe uh move on to uh, a little prediction uh that uh, we had developed and uh that was uh what uh projected group of death could be for canada uh, we, uh, before the, uh, the draw of, uh, uh, what actually took place and who actually Canada, uh, will be facing in Cotter, uh, uh, we, uh, developed, uh, what Canada's, uh, worst, the toughest group of death would be if Canada was to participate. So, uh, well, if Canada was a part of that group of death. So, uh, the four of us, uh, picked Senegal. Uh, as uh, the uh, team from uh, pot three uh, and three of us had picked Germany. However, Tony picked Holland. Uh, he had mentioned that he's a big uh, Dutch uh, supporter. And uh, from pot one, uh, as uh, Frank and Tony picked Brazil, uh, Dan picked France, I picked England. So uh, the four of you just uh, very casually, I mean, uh, what do you think stands out amongst our Choices. Obviously, I don't want to spend a heck of a lot of time about this, but uh, do you think uh, there's one team, one choice that maybe uh, stood out a little bit more than the others? Senegal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Germany. Germany is always up there too, right? Like Brazil. I don't know, man. It's tough. I mean, you know, uh, what Mex uh, German side are we going to see? I mean, they ha did have two losses uh, in uh, World Cup 2018. They made it to the Round of 16, uh, they lost. Did they lose to England? I can't recall off the top of my head. But, uh, you know, what kind of uh, what kind of England are we going to see? Like, uh, uh, is, is it possible uh, that maybe uh, they could uh, recapture what they were close to having in Euro 2020, which was, in fact, in 21? <laughs> <laughs> well, your question was what would be a group of death for Canada, right? So I based it on the team, like Senegal is the, the dominant team in Africa. And I think Senegal matches Canada with athleticism, speed, and they both have those abilities to just counter the shit out of each other. So that would be a tough matchup for Canada. And you look at Brazil, who's been dominant in their South American qualifying and the Netherlands, the reason I picked the Netherlands was because of trajectory, right? Germany is not on the way up. They're kind of now where you have Brazil possess the shit out of the ball. The Netherlands play a similar type of game. Those would be challenges for Canada to take the ball off them and get their opportunities on the counter. So that's why I like I kind of put some thought from a technical perspective why they would be tough matches for for Canada. So that's what I based it on. Um, I don't know what you're going to get with England. Some people tell you England's, you know, the most talented English team since 66. Um, I think they have a lot of players that uh, fail in big moments. So I'm not as convinced with the English team. So that's kind of why I based my pick on that, just to make it quick for you, Dan. Uh, sorry, Randy, because <laughs> uh, you told me to be quick. That's what. No, I well, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, that's a, that's a figurative sense, whatever. I mean, well, like, uh, that, you know, it, it, it was a host kind of... and I want to do what you're asking us to do. Oh, stop it. You're making me, uh, you're, <laughs> you're making me blush, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, I, I guess uh, in the end, uh, you know, as uh, the draw had uh, come and gone and, uh, you know, we'll get uh, right into uh, with, in fact, uh, the, that Canada has uh, drawn with Belgium, Croatia and Morocco. Um, as we were talking about groups of death, I just absolutely love that term. I'm going to start with that. But I mean, like in terms of uh, if there is one for this upcoming world cup tony do you think uh there is a quote-unquote group of death for world cup in carter again um i studied it i looked at it closely the closest thing i came to and again i wouldn't call it a group of death but group h with portugal ghana uruguay and korea republic and the only you expect portugal to get through to get through but those three teams i think are so close tight that it's going to be a battle and I think Portugal's capable of losing to like being upset. We've seen it before. So there's capability for an upset. I always value the African teams when they come to these tournaments, because I think 
they cause trouble for the more technically sound teams. I think they're, they have the ability to disrupt you a bit from your flow. Korea has dominated Asia for a number of years. They don't get, they've got one of the best players in the world in Sun, who plays for Tottenham. So those three teams, I think it's going to be a very tight battle for, for that next spot. And I expect Portugal, Portugal to go through, but that's the closest thing I came to it. I mean, I looked at the other groups, honestly, and you kind of think it's a foregone conclusion for, for, you know, like England and pick a team, you know, you know, England's going through, is the U S good enough to go through? I don't know. Spain and Germany, you can see them going through, right? Um, but yeah, it's the World there's, Cup. Really there's, a, there's always, there's always going to be an upset in the World Cup. Yeah, but I don't think there's like really an actual prevalent actual group of death. Usually there no. is usually like you see one, you're like, oh yeah, that's definitely it. But I don't see one this this World Cup. I just don't. It's funny because uh, I immediately thought that uh, Group E was the uh, group of death. Uh, yeah. Uh, after after the two pots had uh, finished, I mean, Spain and then Germany uh, were in Group E. Uh, then Japan was picked, and uh, the out of pot four would be the winner of Costa Rica and New Zealand. You're thinking that Costa Rica would uh, defeat New Zealand, but you know who knows. Uh, Dan, uh, uh, is there uh, one team that uh, one uh, group that you think might be the toughest of them all? Dan doesn't care. No. There's no Italy. From a Canadian standpoint, you know, <laughs> our draw couldn't have been much, much, uh, much worse than, than it turned out to be. You know, from so if you're Canada, you look at your group as maybe the group of death because you know getting uh, past Belgium and Croatia is going to be yeah, you know, it's going to be really, really, really tough. And then the other groups, you know, you guys kind of alluded to it where. The group with Spain and Germany in it, you know, but then outside of that, you expect those two teams to go through, uh, you know, so there isn't a group where all four teams have, you know, a legitimate chance of getting through. Um, so, you know, I, I think they're, they're pretty balanced, which should, uh, which should create for a lot of great round robin mm -hmm. games. Uh, but short answer, no, I don't think that there is a, a quote unquote group of death this time around. Well, and if, it's, also, if you... it's also because there's more nations. Sorry, Randy, right? Yeah, like if it was still a 24 team tournament, you were guaranteed to get three UEFA teams in, in some of those groups, right? So if you have three UEFA teams and then you get, you know, um, a Uruguay in the group, then you're looking at a real group of death. But, you know, with the expanded amount of teams, yeah. it's, it's going to be harder. Well, you know, uh, that being said, and now let's take a look at uh, the CONCACAF, the rest of the CONCACAF uh, participation you have USA in a group with England, Iran, and the uh, winner of Ukraine, Scotland, uh, Ukraine, Scotland versus Wales. So, I mean, there's three possibilities there. Uh, Mexico's in a group with Argentina, Saudi Arabia, and Poland. And then the uh, mentioned uh, Group E. Uh, Canada's face, uh, one of uh, Belgium is uh, ranks two in the, uh, in the world. Croatia made it to the World Cup final. Uh, you know, it's not a cakewalk. And I'm, it's so amazing that I'm hearing, uh, you know, especially from uh, uh, soccer reporters and uh, those on TSN, it's like, yeah, uh, Canada could, uh, could make it out. I mean, and uh, you know, Tony, you were talking about uh, uh, how much you uh, uh, respect the, uh, the African side. Uh, I think Dan's onto something here. I mean, I don't think that uh, Canada has an easy out. And no, I think, I, I think maybe uh, is a very quickly, uh, maybe, uh, group C, maybe Mexico's group might be easier out of all the CONCACAF groups. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's a tough draw. It's a tough draw because Morocco is a good team too. They've got some, they got players who play for big clubs. Like Hakimi is an elite right back in the world. He just moved from Inter Milan to, to PSG. They've got an attacking midfielder by the name of Hakim Ziyech, plays for Chelsea. He's, he's on the outs with the national team. But if he figures yeah. it out and gets in there, like if he somehow miraculously appears at the World Cup, another tough player to play against. The only thing I say that could work for Canada is Croatia's core is an aging group. Um, Belgium yeah. have the ability to once again come up small in big game situations, but that is usually not until the knockout rounds. Um, so to try and catch them off guard during the group play, 
it's a tall order. There's just way too many incredible players on that team. But again, John Herdman has this team believing, 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 believing. So to me, it's a positive. It's a test for them. It's going to make them stronger for 2026, right? I think their goals should be to compete, to score, and then let the chips fall where they may. But absolutely, it, it is a tough group. I'm with you. Like, I know it's not a cakewalk, not even close. Um, yeah, I guess I just didn't see it before, just, you know, just being happy that Canada was there. But actually, like, examining examining them now, it, it is pretty tough, man. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, where do, uh, where do we expect Canada to finish in this uh, tournament? I mean, hey, uh, uh, we're finally at the uh, cool table with the rest of the cool kids. Uh, we're going to a World Cup. Uh, you know, uh, Dano, uh, for somebody who uh, tasted uh, the sweet uh, 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 sense of victory and had the, uh, the, uh, what you experienced in 2006 and 2014, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 2021, excuse me. Uh, you know, what, what level of satisfaction would you have uh, for Canada's uh, performance for this tournament? Truthfully, if they score a, a few goals, I think it would be great. You know, it, 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 2006 and 2021, when Italy won World Cup, Euro Cup, they weren't supposed to win those tournaments. So Frank said it before, where you, you got to play the game. You know, I, I like this Canadian team a lot of their success is going to be measured on or based on if Alfonso Davies comes back and starts playing the way that he can play. If uh, Jonathan David can, you know, continue his, uh, his magical skill set that he's, he's exhibiting in, in the French league, but, you know, I'm, I'm a PSG fan outside of international soccer. And, you know, this is a team on paper, Tony, you mentioned Hakimi where they're supposed to walk over everybody. They've got, you know, the arguably one of the greatest front lines ever assembled in soccer you know, matched with a goalie that was supposed to be the next coming of Christ, who, you know, <laughs> after winning the Euro, can't win a game now. So, um, you know, anything can happen. But By the way, as, Canada, an, as an AC Milan fan, I'm glad that worked out the way it did. And that's, why Milan, and that's why Milan didn't want to give him 10 million a year. Yeah, that's right. That's I, right. Go on. Sorry. I get, I get it. I get it. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, so, you know, I, I think objectively, you know, even the, the most hardcore of, of Canadian soccer fans, you know, if, if they put up a good fight, they don't get steamrolled like they did in 86 where they don't score a goal and they just sort of fade out into obscurity. If they, if they, if they put up a fight, maybe draw a game or, you know, if, uh, if Davies or David or somebody else, you know, scores a highlight real goal, it's just another building block to, uh, you know, to, to keep the momentum going with this team. It's, it's like we talked about before, you know, you're in a good position now. Uh, you know, you, you, you've put in a lot of hard work to get to the point to where you are now, whether it's recruiting players or, or, or training them or building a system or a culture or an atmosphere, and you can't take your foot off the gas. Now you have to almost, you know, you don't have expectations of winning this tournament. So if you get out of the group, then, you know, you, you, you far exceeded what anybody thought you might do. And then you build on that for 2026 where, you know, you go in, you know, wanting to take that Active, next step yeah. where, you know, you want to win it. Group, you wanna, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, it's, it's, it'll, it'll be, it's, it's just, it's, it's great that they're there, but we can't just rest on our laurels and say, okay, let's just go there and, and you know, it just, you know, run around for whatever 90 minutes times three is. I'm not a mathematician, but, you know, we would just want to see some level of, um, you know, some sort of semblance that we belong in that tournament. And I think that'll go a long way in, in the minds of Canadian fans. Well, uh, so, uh, so sorry to cut you off there, Dan, but uh, because we are uh, uh, live on Apple's ColorCast app, I actually do have a comment from somebody who is listening to our, uh, our show. And wow. it's from, uh, so, yeah, no, uh, so uh, this is the first time we're actually so getting a exciting. comment on uh, What's Up the Sports podcast. So, uh, you know, we, uh, so it's, uh, it's a handle and it's a smooth <laughs> milk. Here. Look at it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm going at the scene. Like, uh, you know, this is, uh, the happiest, uh, happiest you're blushing day. again, Brandy. You're blushing <laughs> again. I am. I yeah, am. It might, no, be, it's, it might be rich and sell from the Stern show. You gotta be careful. Let's read the comment first and then we'll judge. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. No, I got, uh, yeah. So he said, uh, you guys suck. Uh, no, no. It didn't. So it says, uh, this is oh, from I wish us. That's what it said. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it said, uh, Love the soccer talk. Being in the United States, most people really don't care about the World Cup, which is a shame. I honestly think the U.S. will not make it out of group play. That is from Smooth Milk. 
so they have handles on uh, this app. Uh, mine is RC Milton 83. Not a lot of people know me as Randy. Uh, cats out of the bag. Color cast. My name is Randy. But uh, yeah, smooth milk. Thank you so much for the uh, for the comment. And uh, yeah, it is that doesn't, man. It's crazy. And that doesn't <laughs> surprise me uh, about a U.S. soccer fan. I mean, if you follow it closely, I think they've been very disappointing in the eyes of soccer fans. I think you you've expected more because of the talent they have. And guys are sprinkled all over big clubs, you know, Chelsea, Juventus, uh, Barcelona. Um, I don't know if they've got the right coach for that team. Uh, I think they need a guy with a little more experience, but I, I'm not surprised that, you know, a, an American soccer fan has that kind of attitude. I think, I think it's been pretty disappointing for them watching this team. So uh, as uh, we go on here, and uh, of course we know who Canada is now playing, uh, uh, there is a possibility of organizing, not so much a possibility, there will be matches organized, uh, friendlies, as we uh, get that much closer to World Cup. Uh, Frank, I mean, as Canada plays Belgium, prepares for Belgium, Croatia, Morocco, how important are friendlies to teams uh, that may have a style similar to who they're playing against? Obviously, uh, it'd be a real shock if uh, uh, teams organize a friendly with who they're facing before a World Cup. But do you think that will help? Canada, maybe play Italy, for example. Uh, you know what, Randy, those friendlies, you're not giving it 110% like you would on, a, you know, when it's a meaningful game. So how much can you really look into it? Are they bringing all their star players? Are the players going all out? Obviously not. So the game is a lot different, right? The friendly games doesn't mean it. There's not much meaning in it. Just the conditioning, getting the overall atmosphere, getting accumulated with the other players, getting up to that level, that kind of stuff, yes. But in terms of actual players going all out and making an impact for them to be better for the World Cup, I, I, I don't see that happening. Tony, uh, Tony, Dan? Yeah, I was just it'll be, uh, it'll be good for them to at least get exposure to yeah. these more established teams. Like, you know, if you think about matching up against Belgium, you know, outside of their individual skill set on that team, you know, th this is a team that, you know, just even the way that they approach the game is, is different than most teams in CONCACAF. Um, so, you know, to just, just to be exposed to that sort of, uh, you know, positional play, possession type game, uh, you know, European soccer is much different than MLS. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think, it'll, I think it'll go a long way for some of the guys that play in North America exclusively to, you know, have that, uh, just, just have that exposure to, it's almost like uh, you know, I, I liken it to uh, an AHL player being called up to NHL, and they always say the same thing: where the game is just faster, stronger. You know, it's just, it's the same game, but it's just elevated. And I think you know, being exposed to that along the way, you know, and maybe walking all over Italy as you know as, as everybody does these days will, will will give them confidence as well. And then that was a joke uh, towards uh, Italy. If you guys caught that. <laughs> I got it. But I got it. <laughs> So yeah, I, I think, you know, to, to Frank's point, you know, you, you take it with a grain of salt. It is what it is because it's not the true representation of, you know, what the game can be. And, you know, you might not have a full team, but I still think it'll benefit them leading up to and, you know, and, and sort of gearing up to the first World Cup game. It feels like it's important to John Herdman because uh, when he was on the, in the TSN studios on World Cup draw day, he, he talked about potential for two games. One game for sure here, and he really wants one in UEFA. He wants one in Europe against the UEFA team. So I think it's about bringing the group that he sees. I think by the time he gets to September, he'll have a better idea of the group he'll have for Qatar. And so he definitely wants to get them together. And, and whenever the next window is, I'm saying September, I'm just you know using it hypothetically, but he wants a game in Europe. So I think he's taking that one very seriously. He's trying to set up against a, a good European opponent. I'm not sure what he's looking for here when they're when they play a game here, but uh, it seems like it's important to Herdman. Yeah, it's also important for them, like the the, the Canada team, just to get together, right, and build that camaraderie yeah, and of course be equal on the field and and feel each other out and know what's going on and who's who, who's where. So obviously, to build for the own team, yeah, that's that's huge. So anytime they can get together, it'll benefit them for sure. Yeah, the summer's, you know, the summer's going to be a big year for a few of the players. Like Jonathan David mm -hmm. could be gone. He could end up on an even bigger club. I know he'll be he'll be sought after. Um, 
those are moments for players. Those are tough, tough times. So it, it's, it's a huge juggling act for John Herdman. And he, you know, he tells you as much the amount of work that goes into this off the pitch. Uh, mm. We can't even begin to imagine what it's like. You know, as I was watching the, uh, the draw and uh, its proceedings and the pageantry of it all, I was wondering to myself, what does this mean for hockey in Canada? I mean, look, I'm never going to think that uh, hockey is going to be uh, threatened as uh, being removed from uh, the top sport in our uh, country. But uh, 2017, uh, TFC wins MLS Cup. The Raptors win the championship in 2019. Uh, the Blue Jays are... Uh, you know, uh, threatening to be a potential World Series favorite uh, uh, this year, maybe next year. Could we see a participation drop, like a uh, within hockey? Yeah, I think that I think that we're of the last generation to grow up, especially if you grew up in the GTA, to see a good Maple Leafs team. And you've already seen, uh, you know, people drop off or become Edmonton fans or. Uh, you know, start playing soccer or baseball uh, a little bit more. And, and it goes beyond just watching a, a good team. You know, hockey is very expensive to put your kids into, especially if they're not, if they're not good. You know I mean? Like it, it's one thing if you're, if you know that, that, that they're ultimately going to make it and sort of look at it as an investment almost, but if you just want your kid to have fun and, and you know, and, and be on a team and learn a sport and, you know, not just be on the streets, hockey is not a viable option, you know, as a, as a as a parent of a six-year-old, like I can speak with, um, you know, from experience that we've turned towards soccer and basketball and baseball because they're the more accessible. They're not as, um, you know, consuming on your time either. You know, hockey is just, uh, it, it, it's crazy. So, you know, if, if, if we're not as dangerous generation. either, I mean, Dano, you, you got to think about yeah. the injuries and such too, right? Yeah, of course, for sure. So, you know, if, if we're the last generation to, you know, I, I grew up playing hockey and the Leafs were good and everything, you know, hockey, 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 you know, we might know in 20, 30 years if if hockey is still going to remain as as, as top sport, you know, and everything always changes. So I'm not I'm not convinced that it's always going to be hockey in Canada, um, you know, but it'll it'll take a long while for it to be unseated as number one um, should you know should things keep going the way that they're going where you know even look at it as as music you know you know we haven't had one international super group for a long time just because accessibility to music is is much different than it was when we were growing up and it's the same with sports so you know you can watch a soccer game more easily now online than you could 20 years ago because it wasn't on mm -hmm. tln as frank said you know if it wasn't on sunday morning on tln you weren't watching it so, you know, you have you have exposure to this stuff and and, and the more kids uh, get involved with it, we may see a generational switch in uh, in what the popular sport is in Canada. I always use this as the gauge for me because my nephew's mid 20s now. He's a 94 born. So, I'm you know, I'm ha I always see him and his group of friends. Good dudes, you know, makes me feel young when I hang out with them sometimes. <laughs> um, they're all into soccer. You cannot get, they don't know shit about hockey. Uh, if they weren't in fantasy leagues, they're also, my nephew is a coach. He coaches, uh, he's got his, you know, licenses up to a certain point with his buddy. So they coach uh, East York soccer. They're all into soccer, all of them. That's all they know. That's all they do. So I see that as the gauge to where we're probably going to. I've used the, I've used the, uh, Tim Laiwiki reference, what he said a few years back when he was uh, running MLSE, that don't be surprised that based on demographics that you see this shift 20 years down the road where basketball will be bigger than hockey. I mean, I, I, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. It still doubts. But when you have a World Cup of soccer, the most watched sporting event in the world and your country's in it, it's such a big deal because hockey doesn't have that. Like, I don't take the World Cup of hockey seriously. Yeah. Because it's on every, you know, what, 12 years, 13 years, depending on when they feel like putting it on, they're going to put it on. But Tony, um, they also they also the have Olympics, a world they also have a world championship every year in Europe. And it's, it's during the Stanley Cup playoffs. It's and not best on best. Right. No, it's not. So it's yeah. 
it's huge in Europe and wherever who's ever hosting it, but it's, it's not the same thing. It doesn't compare, right? The Olympics. Right. Yes. The Olympics are, are a different story, but again, sometimes the Olympics, sometimes, know, right? sometimes the NHLers go, sometimes they don't, when they don't yeah. go, we don't give a shit. So they're, the, you know, and like I said, this world cup is a joke in my opinion, when you're not consistently having it every four years, world if cup you want to, le- if it, yeah, if you want to yeah. legitimize the thing, you know, keep it consistent. When's the next one in 2026? At least they're getting rid of the team Europe and North America uh, bullshit and having real countries playing it. So that should be good. Yeah. But yeah, I'm with Dan. I think Dan's 100% on the whole pricing thing. Uh, you know, I can afford to put my kids in hockey. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Frank, I mean, you have three boys. Uh, you know, uh, what, what uh, have they uh, been introduced to uh, hockey uh, at any level or? No. Uh, well, the, the, the pandemic definitely stopped things, right? Like they, so when it happened, the pandemic, well, my oldest now is nine. So he was, what, six and a half, seven when this whole started. So obviously six and a half, seven is when you start bringing them into the sports. And I, I was ready to throw them into soccer. First thing is soccer, right? Like that's just the first thing was soccer. And that didn't happen. Hockey, they never, they haven't gravitated towards yet. So who knows? Maybe that is because they just, it's not prevalent anymore as it used to be. Like I, when I was, I got into hockey, I think I was like eight, nine years old, like in terms of watching hockey, playing hockey. My parents never, never enrolled us. Like I learned how to skate on my own, right? Like on the ponds outside with the construction areas. That's where we learned how to play hockey. Like that's how it was back then. But like Tony, like dad is saying, to bring them now, it's expensive. You got the training, you got the, the 6 a.m. practices and the equipment and they want to be a goalie, which I am in ball hockey. And who knows if they want to be like me, like even the goalie equipment, like the, it's expensive, right? Like, I don't know if I'd be able to do it. So, but no, they haven't gravitated towards it. And I'll, if they want to, okay, I'll, you know, take it up with them. But so far they haven't, which is good for my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and uh we will we, we do have an interesting uh take on you like tennis uh, tennis they're into yeah right? hey i mean like uh look tennis at, is uh, look at too, man. yeah absolutely absolutely i mean hey uh uh could uh canada uh win a medal uh the next uh <laughs> olympics uh for basketball uh i mean uh, and canada has been a mainstay in terms of women's soccer uh, uh forever so you know uh it uh would be interesting to see and we're going to talk a little hockey in our uh, rapid fire segment in a few minutes but uh uh guys uh look uh, the uh uh one uh the apparent uh, the uh perceived greatest raptor of all time is uh, returning to scotia bank arena kyle lowry's uh, miami heat will uh be uh, playing the raptors the first time lowry uh, will be playing in toronto uh after signing with miami uh, before the start of the season. Um, Tony, in terms of all the uh, major pro sports uh, when it comes to uh, our city of Toronto, uh, where does Kyle Lowry rank amongst the greatest to don a Toronto jersey? Ooh, um, I, I think he I think he's capable of making the top 10. Uh, when you talk about overall talent, there's there's been a lot more. But um, in terms of, you know, bulldog effort, uh, actually staying with the team for a long time, which is not something we've been used to as, as Raptor fans, longevity. So that's a huge factor. And, and ultimately winning the championship, I think he belongs in the top 10. Uh, you know, it, it took a while to get there. I mean, he didn't come in with the greatest attitude. And it wasn't always the, the rosiest of relationships uh, between him and the, the organization, but I, you know, they wouldn't win. The, they wouldn't have won the championship if, if Kawhi Leonard wasn't a Raptor. I mean, let's be real here, but Kyle was a big part of it. And it's just so amazing that you say that maybe Lowry is in the top 10. Uh, it is a statement that I agree with. However, this is a guy that stayed uh, in Toronto for nine years, won a championship, was an all-star six times. How long did Doug Gilmore stay? And, uh, you know, how long did Roger Clemens stay? I don't think he'll be exactly. uh, considered in that list. But, uh, uh, like, what kind of accolades did Roy Halladay have as a Toronto Blue Jay? I mean, he did win a Cy Young, never made the playoffs. Uh, Dano, 
but sorry, here's the yeah, thing. Go, please. I'm going to interrupt. Here's the thing. Gilmore was one of the top five players in the league during his years in Toronto. Uh, Roy Halladay was arguably the best pitcher in baseball during his years in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Who's the other guy you mentioned? Sorry. Clemens, Roger Clemens. Clemens, back-to-back Cy Young Awards, elite. You know, so it's about where you are in the league. Austin right now, arguably the best goal scorer in the NHL right now. I mean, I'm sure Ovi fans will say, you know, screw you, but he leads the league in goals, right? Kyle was never, I don't think he was ever the top five point guard in the NBA at any point. Am I wrong? Like, uh, someone correct me if I am. I, I don't mm, think so. Top five? <laughs> I don't, I, I, I don't know. I mean, and uh, I, I don't know. I mean, he, uh, being a six time all-star was, a, sorry, Frank, go ahead. Frank. It's just the way he played and the way he just gave 150%, not even 110%, which everyone usually says, like he gave that, extra, <laughs> right? Like he would go in that lane, take that charge, no matter who that player was just to get the foul, like, you know, put it all on the line for the team. He put the team in front of everything. And it paid off in the end, man. He's a grappler. He, he did it. Uh, he did it during All Star games. I mean, uh, exactly. but Dano, <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Dano, you know, uh, during that time as uh, Kyle was uh, part of the Raptors, how much of a draw was he specifically? I, you know, yeah. When people had uh, Raptor tickets uh, during Vince Carter's reign, they wanted to see Vince Carter. They wanted to see Kawhi Leonard. When visiting teams come into uh, Scotiabank, Air Canada Center, uh, they wanted to see uh, LeBron James, Connor McDavid. Uh, you know, they wanted to see uh, Mike Trout, uh, you know, for the J. David Beckham when uh, he was a part of the Galaxy uh, playing Toronto FC. Uh, however, you know, like Frank and uh, maybe Tony was saying that Kyle Lowry, he was a lunch bucket guy. He uh, got his hands dirty. He drew the fouls. Uh which, you know, uh, Toronto fans seem to love. Yeah, I don't know where that comes from, to be honest. You know, we, we love the, we love these guys that aren't necessarily the most skilled, you know, and the way that we treated or the way that we remember Matt Sundin might be representative of that. Um, yeah, and I agree with Tony. You know, Lowry is sort of, a, he's, he's an interesting one because he was never, you know, he was never tops in his spot. He was never, you know, regarded as a, uh, you know, superstar in the league, an all-star for sure. But, you know, he's not on, you know, you know Kevin Durant's level of superstardom. Um, but people love him. And it's the same thing, you know, this this he's experienced with the Tuckers and Ty Domi's, uh, you know, Tiger Williams. Um, so I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to see, you know, and, and a lot of the names that, that you guys talked about before, I hope this doesn't take us too far off course, but those are all white males. So, you know, him being a, a black man, I don't know what that does to his standing or the way that people viewed him or, you know, if he became, um, if he elevated, elevated himself to must-see TV in Toronto. Um, you know, definitely loved and appreciated for his hustle and his effort. You know, uh, but I don't know. It'll be interesting to see, you know, t- tonight will uh, be... I'm sure he'll get a, 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 a huge ovation tonight. Sure. Um, but down the road, you know, is, is there a statue of, of uh, Kyle Lowry coming? Probably not. I um, do think so. Well, I think so. Unless I, I think if they're, if they put together a, what the Leafs have, which is uh, legends row, yeah. I think you put it in that, but if you're putting a standalone stat and it was funny, they were having this argument on overdrive, yeah, uh, which was hilarious. I was, you know, because Jeff O'Neill was just pissed <laughs> at Hayes for for being so stingy when it comes to um, when it when it comes to statue building. But so I kind of agreed with hey, if you're going to do a Legends Road type thing, then you can. But a standalone, I don't see it, and I don't agree with the race thing really, um, Dan. Because I think if if Kawhi Leonard chose to stay here and see the rest of his career out as a Raptor, I think if Vince. See, the difference between Lowry and those other guys is that he wanted to stay. Everybody else wanted to leave, so we'll never know. I mean, can you imagine if Vince Carter finished his career as a Raptor? You don't think he would be regarded as one of the top two athletes in the history of our city? Look how we look. We still look at Jose Bautista in this tremendous regard. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would imagine you're putting him in a top five category. I just think it was, 
it's a Toronto thing. Wendell Clark wanted to stay. He loved being in Toronto. Uh, Darcy Tucker was the same way. I, ultimately, the difference was that our superstars, the elite guys that we had here, none of them wanted to stay. So we'll never know, right? Yeah. And they just, yeah. they just happened to be black. I, you know, I don't know if that's a connection or not, but we didn't get a chance to enjoy them for their entire careers or for a huge portion of it. I mean, we well, did Vince, but Vince's departure was based on him demanding to get out. Yes. And whether you like to admit it or not, he quit on the team until he got the trade he was looking for. So and you, it you hurt can't, more because Vince was our guy. And we, it hurt. Yeah, absolutely. I think if Kyle's was, you know, I think if Kyle was one of the within one of the elite point guards in the league, if he was in a Chris Paul category, for sure, absolutely he'd go down as one of our greatest athletes. Well, uh, you know, I, I am going to say right now that I think top three, one of them would be Pinball Clemens. <laughs> Are you being sarcastic? or No, I'm not. I mean, yeah. like, this I mean, is a guy. And done, yeah. I, it depends on, depends on who's a part of this poll. But, uh, you know, if uh, maybe if you're north of our age, uh, uh, yeah, he's a recognizable name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's obviously. It, it, listen, I'm, you could put Sebastian Javenko. You should, right? the dominance he had and if, if you're going to talk pinball clemens based on the league he was playing in then we have to put sebastian javenko in the same category josie altador because these guys were absolutely dominant in that i put, joe, Car in I put joe carter in there yeah, i put both put joe, in there joe carter and you still you got to put robbie in there yeah. Oh, yeah yeah absolutely robbie to me rob robbie alomar is still the best the best player I've ever seen for the Blue Jays, like as a Blue Jay fan, like I, I still think he's the best Blue Jay ever. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, um, little sidetrack. Uh, what, a little, what, what it, he did that's a great man. Field. I really want to get into this one too. <laughs> but uh, you no, know, pin, pinball is an awesome citizen of the city. Yes, tremendous and yes. such a great guy. And I've met him on a few occasions. I met him once uh, working, and he's it's genuine. What you see is not fake; it's actually real. Like he's yes. he's a super guy. But obviously, it's tough to put a CFL player on that list for sure. If perhaps, you're talking about perhaps. if you're talking about the whole scope of of him being a part of this city and a citizen, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, very quickly, uh, Frank uh, Lowry, the greatest Raptor of all time. In my opinion, I think so. And most important, uh, it's tough, man. Carter, I mean, uh, between, Carter, did his, uh, Carter did his thing here and put Toronto, you know, elevated them and put them on the map to have people recognize who we were here. But I think just Larry, for everything that he did and winning that championship, everyone's like, oh, we had Kawhi, so we won it. But I don't think this team went anywhere with Bell Kyle. I don't think so. He's the piece that put everything together and he accepted what Masai did. He accepted the trade and he was on board on it. Like in the beginning, he might not have been, but somewhere along that in that season, he changed his way and just everything came together. And I think no matter what this team, that team did not go anywhere without him and everything he brought for the team. And uh, actually, guys, lo and behold, we have another comment from uh, Smooth Milk. And he says uh, that, uh, uh, I, where was that comment? I, now I lost it. Uh, that uh, Vince Carter definitely uh, would be, Kyle would be a second. I believe, I, uh, it's so weird. I, I lost, He did write something, I swear to God. I'm not imagining this. Here we go. Vince Carter, for sure, <laughs> I would put Kyle Lowry second. And, you know, I am of the opinion that, Kawhi Leonard is the most skilled Raptor in Toronto history. I think that DeMar DeRozan is the most loved Raptor. I think Kyle Lowry is the most accomplished as a Raptor. I think the greatest Raptor is Vince Carter. And it hates, I hate saying that. <laughs> based on yeah. talent, what he gave us? Based, based on, on, uh, based on was... talent. Oh, sorry, please. No, no. Yeah, Absolutely. I don't see this is this, this the discussion is, are we talking about pure talent, hundred percent best player we've ever seen? Sure. I mean, even Kawhi, he, he doesn't have the flash that Vince Carter had, but Kawhi is the best all around player, you know, in the game when he's going and he's healthy and, you know, everything's going for him. But yeah, no, for sure. It, 
I don't think anybody's wrong in this argument because again, Kyle Lowry is, you know, he's like a third line centerman. He's a checker. He's a, you know, he's a shit disturber. He's a bulldog. It's just a different kind of game he played. He was never an elite point guard in terms of top five or some, you know, was he top 10 ever? Maybe, I guess I, Again, help me out here. It's Who, just, Vince? It's, just, it, no, it's no. hard because every team, like when in team sports, right? You got like hockey, soccer, you got the five guys, uh, sorry, the hockey, basketball, you got the five players on or on your team that are the, the most important pieces. So you have your Kawhi, you have your Surge, you have your Green, you have your Pascal, you have Fred, but who was it that kept that thread together? It was Kyle, Right. And like, for example, just take a little bit off subject, you bring it to the Leafs. Like, so you have this team with, you got Matthews, you got Marner, you got hopefully Campbell does good in net. You got, uh, you got Giordano now from, for, for defense. You got hopefully Muzzin's back healthy, but who is it that is going to elevate this team when we need it most? That's the question we need answered. For me, Kyle did that for this team. So for me, he's mm-hmm. the greatest. Yeah, no, I, it's, it I, is a great discussion. Sorry, Tony. I, I don't believe they win the championship with DeMar DeRozan on the team yeah. still. You know, no, I, absolutely. I, I just think – and and the reason why Kyle got over it is because he had no choice, right? Like he realized, all right, my best chance to win a championship is going to be with this number two guy here if he's if he's healthy and, and going. Yeah. So, um, But I, I think because of longevity and commitment to the organization, I'd put him – I'd put him on top. I just put him on top just for sentimental reasons. Cause he gave me more at the end of the day than one, uh, what Vince did based on the exit. Right. I can't, can't overlook that. I'd retire his number before I retire Vince. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, and I guess uh, the only reason why you would retire Vince's is because of uh, chronological order. The fact that Vince is now retired and that he's been, but uh, in terms of uh, what Kyle Lowry had, uh, uh, officially brought uh, to uh, the organization, especially that championship uh, meant uh, uh, is such a great deal. So uh, as we are doing this podcast, Dan has been in a parking lot as his son was uh, uh, taking part in a class. Uh, Dan does have to get going, uh, but uh, Dan, really great to uh, see and talk to you again. Hope you and yours are doing great and uh, really hope uh, we could uh, hook up again soon for another episode. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me, Randy. Sorry I can't stick around to talk about uh, how much of an idiot uh, Tyler uh, Tyson is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to get to that in a moment, for sure. Bye, Dan. You guys have fun with that. See you guys. Thank All you. Right. All right, nice cheers. Meeting. Cheers. That being said, uh, we uh, will go to our rapid fire segment. It is big deal or no big, big deal, no big deal. Uh, Tony Antonio and Frank DeFrenza are with me. And uh, shout out to Dan for bringing this to my attention as... Uh, Tyson Nash is a former NHLer who is now doing color commentary for the Arizona Coyotes. So the Coyotes were playing the Anaheim Ducks and uh, uh, Coyotes veteran Jay Beagle took to uh, took it upon himself to cross check Trevor Zegris in a five nothing as the uh, uh, Coyotes were down five nothing. Uh, Tyson Nash's comments was. Uh, due to the fact that Zegris has a great level of skill, apparently, and uh, should be expecting uh, to get uh, that kind of treatment uh, if you are apparently showing up the other team. His uh, Nash's comments specifically, that's the problem with these young players. You want to embarrass guys. You want to skill it up. You have to be prepared to... Sorry, uh, you have to be prepared to get punched in the mouth. Uh, Tony, uh, you had mentioned that you had had a discussion about this with a friend of yours uh, the day before. Is this a big deal or no big deal? Well, it's it's only a big deal because it's such a stupid, idiotic, archaic comment from a guy who had no skill. I mean, congratulations, you got the league, but you wouldn't understand what it was like to have what Charter Zegras has. And this hockey culture thing, I mean, I, I'm an old school guy too, but I'm also a believer in, hey, we got we to gotta go with the times here as well. 
you know, there, there are a lot of skilled players in this league. And I think moves like that are awesome. And if you can do it, and if you have the balls to do it, you shouldn't have to answer for it with a fight or a teammate shouldn't have to have his face just completely mangled um, because the hockey culture says you can't do that. Like, I, I mean, thank God Don Cherry is no longer working because I would love to see what he had to say about it. And I'm sure John Tortorella uh, will have something to say about it. I mean, God forbid skilled players display their skills in the game. This wouldn't happen in the NBA. This wouldn't happen in, in, in football. They're doing everything they can to protect the quarterback. They protect the stars. This is the only league, and it's not because of JB. It's because of the hockey culture, and I don't know how it's going to change. I don't know when it's going to change, but when we, you know, you think about what we talked about in a previous segment, you know, where the demographic is going, where we're following sports more, um, that's part of the reason why the younger generation will look at this and say, what the hell? Like, wait a second, I can't watch a skilled player be skilled? some guy might beat the shit out of him because he made a great play. Mm. Yeah. I think I'm going to watch basketball where I could watch, you know, Trey young be Trey young and John ja Morant be John ja Morant without getting hacked. Yeah. Right. I, I agree with you. you know, actually, uh, before, before you comment, uh, Frank, I remember watching, uh, however, inside the NBA and uh, when uh, the Lakers uh, visited Cleveland to face the Cavs, uh, LeBron James uh, had an incredible dunk over his, uh, former teammate, uh, oh. current friend, uh, Kevin Love. Yeah. Shaquille O'Neal's comments were, uh, this is LeBron James's return to Cleveland. If I was Kevin Love, and I'm paraphrasing, if I was Kevin Love, I would let him get the lane and uh, have the dunk. Tell me Shaquille O'Neal would not have uh, tried to do everything <laughs> he could have to uh, stop um, – I don't know, uh, said player uh, who uh, is making his return uh, back to his uh, home stadium. Uh, you know, it seemed that uh, that Shaquille O'Neal or uh, any uh, star does think that there is a uh, level of respect that you do have to give the LeBron Jameses of the world. But, you know, Tony, uh, there's no chance that anybody does that to Sidney Crosby. There is no chance that nobody does that to, to Connor McDavid. I don't think. Frank, uh, you want to you see know. Crosby. You got punched in the back of the head, concussion. No, I think they do. I mean, I, I think... The Crosby they, hit was from behind in the back of saying, his head, and he went down and had his mm -hmm. concussion and hampered his career, man. He hurt got, him for like two, two and a half years. Uh, that's got, against Tampa, right? That was the... El no, the outdoor. That was... Uh, that, that was oh, the uh, the elbow from uh, the tall guy? Steckel, was, was it? Ste it was David Steckel. Steckel and I, yeah. I still believe that was an incidental hit. Yes. Like, I don't think it... But there was a sequence during one of their playoff series against the Blue Jackets where Callahan, who he's, he's had a feud with throughout their careers, cross-checked him on the ice twice in the back of the head, twice in the back of the head. Just you can see it, the back of the neck. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, this is crazy. Like, this is nuts. No other league would allow it. No. I, if, if, if Connor McDavid and Sidney Crosby tried that lacrosse goal, Someone would come after them. Mm -hmm. Someone would no, come after maybe. them. No, maybe. Yeah. That's, I think it's 100%. That's just, it's the hockey culture, right? You know, uh, it's so funny. Uh, I had a discussion with a guy who was uh, a few years ago who was 10 years younger than me, and we were talking about fighting in hockey. And, uh, you know, uh, I was uh, four. Uh, you know, the lessening of fighting in hockey, that kid uh, who played uh, minor pro hockey for Whitby, uh, died on the ice and uh, this guy 10 years younger than me said that I don't understand hockey and I lost it I was like I was going to games in Maple Leaf Gardens before you were born you understand and uh, you know it, Tyson Nash scored 64 points in 374 games and you're telling me that uh, hockey teams and the hockey culture is to water down the success of somebody as a potential superstar like Trevor Zegras. Uh, and yeah. it's, give me a break. Yeah, exactly. You want to see these guys. You want to see this talent. You want to see what these kids can do. Connor, Connor Bedard coming up. This guy's got, he is nasty. His hands are filthy. The moves this kid got and what? I don't want to see that. Of course I want to see that. Right. So what? We have to worry that some guy, a goon's going to beat him up for doing a nice move. Too bad. You got undressed. You got undressed. Take your lumps and go and, you know, try and stop him the next time. 
right? Pick up your jock strap, put it on and try and stop them the next time. Well, I've always said this argument uh, time and time again, is that if a uh, city has a team with the most fighting majors versus uh, the team with the most points in the league, chances are they're going to go watch the team with the most points. So, uh, you know, uh, Tyson Nash, I think uh, you're definitely in the wrong on this one. Uh, you know, uh, bringing it uh, back to the beautiful game, guys, uh, there's a proposed uh, new site for a new soccer specific facility uh, right by uh, Woodbine Racetrack, which is, uh, I guess if you want to put it in a geographical sense, northwest of downtown Toronto. Uh, and uh, it is uh, the potential home for York United, uh, who is a part of the Canadian Premier League. Um, Frank, uh, it's apparently an 8,000 seat stadium. And uh, as mentioned, a, 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 a legitimate training ground uh, for soccer. Uh, is this a big deal or no big deal? Oh, big deal, man. Huge. Like I was looking at the link that you sent and the outline of uh, the layout of it looks awesome, first of all. And to have another, to have a state-of-the-art facility for training and developing, like obviously, you know, more exposure, more games, more money coming into the system, flooding into the system. It helps us, helps develop the players. And you're, you're talking about kids, what, 10 years old right now, they're going to benefit from this, right? The development of these kids coming up, eh, it's, it's huge, man. Huge. Exposure. Soccer exposure is live in Canada, man. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, Tony, I guess uh, with everything that we talked about of uh, soccer versus hockey, uh, you know, you think of comments like Tyson Nash and you have to wonder if uh, parents like yourselves are going to say, uh, you know what, uh, this is a culture I don't want my kid to be a part of. Soccer seems pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's all on the table for sure. And in addition to cost and, and what is best for your kids and what your kids want to do at the end of the day is the most important thing. But I agree, the more the merrier, as, as many opportunities and facilities available, accessibility to young soccer players, I think this could benefit the women just as much because, you know, playing in a packed 8,000 state seat stadium looks better than having eight to 10,000 people in a 20,000 seat stadium, Absolutely. right? So, Absolutely. So it works for them. The more the merrier. This is part of the reason why Canada has risen so quickly in terms of their national team. The men, anyway, the women have been good for a while is, you know, academies, facilities, more money being poured in. So, you know what, the more the merrier, it's nothing but positive. And uh, finally, guys, uh, uh, Formula One, has uh, announced uh, a stop in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. It's going to go to uh, Sin City for the first time in, I believe, 40 years. And part of the track will be the uh, famous Las Vegas Strip. Um, uh, there was a Netflix series. I, for one, haven't watched it. App apparently, it was uh, quite uh, intriguing. And uh, uh, Formula One will be uh, making its way to uh, Las Vegas. Uh, Tony? Is this a big deal or no big deal? Well, you picked the wrong guy to ask a Formula One question to. I'll tell you that because I don't watch a second of it. But <laughs> Vegas, F, I, I know how huge F1 is. I understand that. Uh, the only thing I know about F1 is that when it's in Montreal, if when it was in Montreal, uh, a few friends visited it, Montreal during those F1 events. There were good times. So that's all I know about it. But Vegas, F1, sounds good. Frank, I, I'm all for it, man. Everything's bigger in Vegas, better in Vegas. I like the, you look at these court, these tracks around the world and, and how cool they are. And, you know, being on the strip is awesome and the lights and yeah, it looks cool. So I'm all for it. Not a huge Formula One guy. I've been getting into it a bit. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that one. So uh, listen, guys, uh, our, our uh, big fan, Smooth Milk, did actually ask us a couple of questions. They're asking right. us uh, professionals, us, uh, you know, uh, analysts. I don't know how you want to determine three scrubs like us, but uh, uh, he did want to know uh, 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 what our thoughts are in terms of Edmonton and Calgary for the uh, Stanley Cup and uh, for making the playoffs. Uh, Smooth Milk wants to know, uh, what do we think of... Uh, the Oilers and the Flames, are they going to have a successful run in the playoffs? 
I think they have a chance because the West is way weaker than the East. But I mean, Calgary is Calgary has been the dominant team in the league pretty much wire to wire. They got off to a little slow start, but they they're one of the best teams in the league. But I think there's a real chance for Calgary for sure. Edmonton, why not? I think the path to the Stanley Cup final is a lot easier in the West than it is in the East. I'd agree with Tony. I just don't think that Edmonton's goaltending will bring him to that next level. They might get around maybe, but I don't see them going to conference finals or the Stanley Cup finals without, you know, without different goalies than Koskinen or uh, Smith. So. And uh, he also did ask, uh, did, uh, what do we think the chances are for the Maple Leafs uh, in terms of getting out of the first round? Stanley Cup champions. There it is. Yeah, that's right. So Frank and I are Leaf fans. Uh, Tony, for as long as I've known him and many years before, uh, pledges his allegiance to the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, but you do have an appreciation for the Leafs, Tony. I saw you at of a Leaf game, ironically of enough, course. in Montreal. Yeah, well, yeah, the, those were fun times, too. We used to do bus trips uh, every year when we were younger, organized by my cousin. Um, great times. Um, you know what? They have a chance to get past the first round, right? Of course they do. I think they're good enough. Um, they just have to get over themselves, right? They have the biggest leap the Leafs need to take is the one that stands in front of them, which is themselves. How ready are they ready to play a playoff style game? I've seen flashes of it. I think they are capable. Um, it takes a lot of patience. And it's tough when you have a really, really talented team, guys with a lot of skill. It's, it's, it's ingrained in you, right? You want to, you want to try that extra move. You want to, sometimes you got to pull back when you're playing in the playoffs. So we'll see. We'll see. I've been, I, I've been trying know. to, I've been trying to analyze this team all year and it's, it's, they make it very hard for us to do that because against the top teams, they play phenomenal against the bottom half of the league. They play horrible. So how do you, <laughs> so, so that could be a good thing for them going into the playoffs because they, they're going to know how to play against those teams. The Penguins have a similar, the Penguins, I don't know what they are because they still think they're the 2016, 2017 Penguins and they, they're not, they can't play an up and down run and gun style. Like they're, they were used to do. They got away with it back then. They can't get away with it. Now, Mike Sullivan always talks about playing the right way. And sometimes they should, so they shy away from that. So it scares me come playoff time can they bear down and focus? Cause they've had trouble doing that since their 17 Stanley cup, totally different team. Their core is older, right? Um, your core is much younger. So the skill level is there, but how prepared are they to play playoff hockey? So if yeah. they, I mean, they're doing better against the better teams, that could be a good thing for them going into the playoffs. Tony, the give, East me Sydney, so give, me Sydney, give me Sydney Crosby any day. I'll take it, man. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've said that to guys many times over the years. And like anyone, any time it comes up, oh, you know, McDavid, I'm like, no, nah, give me Crosby any day of the week, man. Yeah, any no, I agree. I agree with you. But the fact of the matter is he's older. He's played a lot of hockey. I'll still take so, him. I yeah. will still take him. <laughs> oh, me too. Me too. I, would you? Okay. So I, Frank, would you have taken Fleury? Marc-Andre Fleury? Uh, I Three Stanley Cups did he win? If you're you're comparing him to Mrazek, yes, I would rather have <laughs> Campbell and Flurry other than Campbell and Mrazek, hundred percent. So who's your who's your starting goalie? Campbell or uh, Flurry? Because mm. honestly, Flurry. I mean, yeah, I, I would go uh, Flurry because Campbell, I, 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 I just I, haven't had faith in Campbell, man. I think uh, I think that uh, I mean Flurry definitely definitely has the. Uh, the, uh, the resume, he uh, wasn't that long ago where he took uh, the Vegas Golden Knights uh, yeah, to the uh, the final. Well, I guess it was what? Was it 17? So maybe it was, yeah, five years ago. So, uh, you know, Father Time uh, is catching up, but uh, does Jack Campbell have what it uh, takes to uh, to lead? We'll find to lead out. <laughs> to the first, uh, uh, past the It'll... first round. Yeah, we'll definitely find out for sure. I have There's one question for you guys. Since you guys yes, are both, uh, since you guys are both a soccer game when they qualified, how was that drum? Like, how did that feel when the whole stadium just stopped and that when that happened? Tony, you want to? Um, you know what? The drum thing is cool. I was never a fan of the stealing the Iceland chant, so I never yes. take part in that. I don't do that. 
Um, my moment for me, like I said, when Atiba came on as a substitute, you know, I looked at his career and how underappreciated he's been his whole career, like not talked about 39 years old and being a part of the team that makes the world cup. When a lot of guys he played with in the past didn't get to experience that. That was my moment. That was when I was like, Oh my God, this is, this is crazy. It's happening. But yeah, I mean, the drum part and Jonathan Osario seem to go hand in hand. We were used to hearing it during MLS Cup yeah, final yeah. too when they won. So um, that wasn't as big a deal for me as, as that substitution and, of course, the final whistle. Yeah, and actually, uh, I uh, echo Tony's sentiments with regards to the, uh, the Viking clap from Iceland. I don't participate in it because I think that we <laughs> it's uh, a ripped rip off, it off. Right? Yeah, it's a ripoff. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not... Uh, you know, I, I don't know uh, what the historical significance is, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't like doing it. Uh, I've been to a ton of national matches at BMO Field, like uh, from St. Kitts and Nevis, like I said, uh, St. Kitts and Nevis and St. Lucia, Cuba, Panama a couple of times. I went to uh, pretty much all of the qualifiers uh, that were in Toronto and Hamilton. Uh, those days in uh, early, uh, like 2009 and what well, I guess it was 2013, 2012, like that was not a raucous Canadian crowd. It was raucous, but I mean, it was a bunch of new Canadians and first generation Canadians who are cheering for their, uh, where their roots came from. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, it's, it's a, the only bad component to how beautiful the, uh, the diversity is in our city and country. I mean, uh, you know, I'll take uh, all of the diversity that we have uh, rather than having a 100% unanimous Canadian sports crowd. So it makes it so special here, right? Like, absolutely. So, absolutely. But you can see when there's something to cheer for, there's 100%. Gonna be, you know, if there's something to cheer for, which is what we have now, yeah. you're going to see it. Like it was, it was the most pro Canadian crowd we've seen in Toronto ever. But there was a reason for it because they that was a World Cup qualifying clinching game opportunity for them. You know, I think Soccer Canada did a good job on how they sold tickets too. I mean, you had yes. to be part of the red and white club. I paid the $50 membership just to ensure that I get my first crack at it. I mean, the Voyageurs on Facebook, they're going not they were going after people who were putting them on sale. Yeah, just just out of fear that they would end up getting snatched up by the opposing country and stuff like that. So, I mean, they, yeah. everybody made sure that we had a pro Canadian crowd that day. You know, it, it's so funny, Tony, because I was at the uh, the Cavaliers game at Scotia Bank uh, that night when Canada played Costa Rica, and there was a guy who's a season seat holder that was sitting behind me. And I had my Alfonso Davies jersey underneath my Raptors jersey. Uh, and, and no word of a lie, because I'm a loser like that. But, uh, you know, uh, this guy was like so disappointed and so pissed that he wasn't able to get uh, tickets for Sunday's game against Jamaica. And I said straight up, I'm glad how they, uh, they did it, how they did it, because there was a lot of people, uh, you know, the two of us, uh, you know, people of the Voyager supporter group who – like uh, invested a lot of money in tickets for the qualifiers for Russia, for Brazil, <laughs> for uh, South Africa. And uh, Frank, for your original question there, uh, it, uh, it was just uh, a culmination of all of the, of all of the opinions, you know, in, in this country of all of the influence coming from other parts of the world, in my opinion, uh that all of the immigration and everything that uh that have taken place from europe from south america um i mean uh there's a lot of uh, uh south asian kids who play uh who play soccer as well because uh you know it's uh it was that much uh, affordable and it, uh you're seeing it now and you know take a look at this squad i mean you know you have Haitian representation with Jonathan David. You have Trinidadian representation with uh, Atiba Hutchison. Uh, Liberian Ghanaian representation with Alfonso Davies, Ecuador from Jonathan Osorio. And that's what this team is about. And, you know, it's beautiful to see. And, you know, I'm, uh, as my father-in-law and my, uh, my in-laws are Italian, 
as much as I uh, cheer for the Italian side, like my country is now in the World Cup, you know, for the first time in uh, for the first time in my cognitive Our life. Country. Our like, country. <laughs> yeah, but I'm talking about me. But uh, <laughs> but I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't remember World Cup 86. And uh, the fact that Canada is a part of this, uh, the most incredible tournament in the world, it's everything. It's absolutely huge. everything. Awesome. It's huge. Yeah. You know what? I'll, I'll if I can say like, we, of course, sport, please. sports has always been about bringing people together. And that's what I love about it. That's why I'm very like, it's one of the things I love. We live in a time now where we have, you know, between politics and media, there's always an attempt to divide people, it's setting narratives to divide people all the time. And that's why I hate when politics gets into sports. I mean, it's unavoidable. But that, I hate when it does it because at the end of the day, in its purest form, what happens Sunday afternoon is a bunch of people, like Randy said, different diversity, different culture. I, I took one of my coworkers with me who's a staunch Jamaican supporter. Every time we're sitting at lunch at work, that's all she talks about is how great Jamaica is. And we always tease each other. And I told her, you know what, I'm going to bring you to the game. You could wear whatever the hell you want, but be prepared to get chirped at the end of the game because you're not winning. But and she was still cheering for Canada. Don't get me wrong. But at yeah, the end of, course, of the day, of those are the special things about sports that in its purest form actually brings people together. And I, you know, I love that feeling. It's a great feeling. Yeah, for sure. So uh, guys, this has been an absolute blast. Uh, you know, uh, probably one of the longer episodes uh, that we have <laughs> uh, done. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, it's a, uh, especially when, uh, with the topics that we covered, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's no three better people, uh, to have than yourselves. Uh, you know, shout out to Dan for, uh, doing, uh, an hour and a half in a parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not really the warmest day out there. Uh, but, uh, to you, uh, uh, Tony, Frank, uh, you know, as always the pleasure is mine. Let's do it again soon. Okay. Yeah, man. Thank you. Our pleasure. Take care. All right. For Tony Antonio, Frank DeFrenza, Dan Legieri, who I'm sure is uh, on his way home after picking up his kid from gymnastics class. I'm Randy Coure. This is What's Up the Sports Podcast. Uh, shout out to the Abatsi Project, Mike Abatzidis for the great track, Oh, What a Night, which you could find uh, as you are listening to this podcast via your favorite podcast catcher. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're keeping safe. And we will talk to you next time.